it and extraordinary because it has more surface area. Okay, they have increased relative surface area. And the other important issue, which uh, or other important qual quality which nanomaterials show is quantum effects of nanomaterial. So uh, to understand this very well, let's take this example here of a cube. Okay, we have a cube of two centimeter by two centimeter by two centimeter. Now, if we calculate the surface area, if as you can see here. The surface area comes 24 centimeters square, right? And the volume comes 8 centimeter cube. Now, the same cube we distribute in the cubes of 1 centimeter each. So, so now, how many cubes we have? We have 8 cubes, as you can see in this picture on the right hand side, right? So now, these 8 cubes, just give me a minute. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. If we take those eight cubes and then we try to calculate the surface area, the surface area is 48 centimeters square while the volume is the same, right? Now, why increased relative surface is important? Because most of the reactions take place at the surface. If available surface is more, then the reaction rate will be more and it will I think, was I muted from your side? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay. So, uh, so uh, we are talking about the surface area, right? So the surface area is more in terms of nanomaterials because they are small particles and for the same quantity, for the same volume, if the material is nanomaterial, then the surface is more and surface is more then it is more important because the reactions can take place easily because more surface is available. The other unique quali quality is quantum effects. Now, what is quantum effects? Quantum effect is uh, because the electron is confined in a smaller, very, very, very small space in nanomaterial. So it gives unique optical properties and sometimes unique phys other physical properties also. So that is the quantum effect or the quant quantum confinement of electron, which gives us different and unique properties. So that's why nanomaterials are important, right? Now, if we see the distribution of nanomaterial dimensionality in commercialized products, what we find here is that, see, if you can see this figure, this pie chart here, you can see all, all the nanomaterials are used in some way or the other in commercial products. But see, if you see this green thing, green thing is the most which is covered and it is because of nanoparticles, nanoliposomes and miscellaneous nanomaterials are mostly used in commercial products. So now, since all the commercial products are using, almost all the commercial products are using nanomaterials, it is important to understand why nanomaterials are important and why we need to understand how to synthesize and how many procedures we can use to synthesize those nanomaterials. So now let's move on and let's see. See, there are so many applications. We will not go into details of those applications, but as you can see, all aspects of life has some or the other contribution by the nanomaterials, be it supercapacitors, lithium ion batteries, photothermal therapies, hydrogen storage, coatings, drug delivery, fuel cells, electrocatalysis, carbon dioxide capture and co conversion, what not, everywhere we need applications of nanomaterials. So before we go to synthesis st strategies, we should understand what we are looking for. I mean, what we are trying to synthesize here. We are trying to synthesize a large variety because nanomaterials can be categorized in zero dimensional materials, one dimensional, two dimensional and three dimensional materials. 
Now, this is a large variety. So there cannot be just one procedure which can take care of all the things. You say nanomaterial and you take this one procedure and you synthesize it. It will not work like that. So for zero dimensional materials, there are different strategies because they are different in terms of their size in different dimensions. One dimension, so there is one dimension which is of the uh, nano order. Then there are two dimensions and three dimensions. So there are different varieties of the materials which needs to be synthesized. So we need to have a different approach for each kind of uh, material which we are trying to make here. Okay. So let's move on to next one. So we will look at the synthesis of nanoparticles. But before that, we need to understand what are the things that we should consider before we think about synthesizing such materials. So there are certain challenges, certain issues which are important and which needs to be considered before we think about synthesis procedure. So we need to ask certain questions. Can we control the particle size of the nanomaterial? Can we control the shape of the nanoparticles or can we control the structure? Whether can, if we, if we need for some application, if we need crystalline structure, can we create a crystalline structure of certain nanomaterial? Or if we need amorphous material, can we create the amorphous material also? So then we can, while synthesizing already, we can consider these things and we can control these parameters. Can we control particle size distribution? So what is particle size distribution? So suppose we want, for some application, we want some particles which should be 20 nanometer to 80 nanometer. We don't need larger than, larger than 80 nanometers and lesser than 20 nanometers. So we need this distribution mostly. So that, can we control that? So it seems not very practical and not very easy, but then there are ways that we can do it. So we will go into those things, but not so much deep details, but we will at least broadly try to understand how we can do that. So again, uh, I will repeat it because particle size, shape, structure, and particle size distribution, these things are important because they decide ultimately the property of the material. So if we have, for example, particle size very, very small, we can get certain magnetic properties which we cannot get when the particle size is increased. Similarly, for the optical properties or electrical properties, same thing goes with shape, structure, and particle size distribution. So that's why if we want to control or if we want to optimize some physical properties or some other properties other than physical properties, structural properties, then we need to take care of these parameters, how to control these parameters, okay? So keeping all this in mind, if we look at the approaches, that synthesis approaches, what are the synthesis approaches for nanomaterials exist these days? So there are broadly two kinds. So one is top-down approach, the other is bottom-up approach, okay? So today, in our talk or our discussion, we will talk mostly about bottom-up approach, but both approaches are broadly used and for different, different applications. So top-down approach, as the name suggests, you have a bigger, bigger uh, chunk of the material and then you either cut it or etch it or grind it or you ball mill it and mechanically, you try to reduce the size again and again over and over and eventually you reach to the size that you are desiring. So that is top-down approach, okay? Then lithography is another way of doing it where you can use different sources. You can use photo source or electron beam source. So these two kinds of lithography is also possible for the top-down approach. We will not go into details of top-down approach today, but bottom-up appro approaches we will understand more because they are more mostly used in R&D of nanoparticles. And some most, most of the industries also, bottom-up approaches are very popular, particularly in pharma industry and other things. Okay, so 
bottom up approach starting material is generally gaseous state or liquid state okay and then in gaseous state uh, material when you and you have beginning material is gas phase then there are two kinds of vapor deposition physical vapor deposition and chemical vapor deposition so we call it sh in short pvd and cvd you must have studied in school very elementary uh, information about this and in your college years also you must be studying about it so physical vapor deposition uh, basically is a general idea is that uh, you have a substance you create a vapor and you deposit it on a substrate broadly so there are different ways to do that and those different ways are inert gas condensation evaporation that can be used by thermal or electron beam then plasma arcing laser ablation and sputtering so these things we will see in some details and then we'll see cvd then the other approach is liquid phase fabrication where starting material is in liquid form so then there are different procedures like colloidal wet chemical synthesis sol gel micro emulsion method and spray pyrolysis so we will see them one by one so so let's understand exactly what happens in top down approach so in top down approach what happens you take a bigger chunk of the material you divide it in smaller things and even smaller even smaller and even smaller while when you take bottom up approach you have the smallest particle in your hand and then you go up so then uh, earlier initially you have molecular or atomic level particles and then those atoms act as nucleus for growth and then nuclei reacts as a reactor to grow the particles and the particles nanoparticles grow around the nucleus due using agglomeration or some other techniques we will see that so there are some advantages and disadvantages of both the approaches so in bottom up approaches there are advantages that ultra fine nanoparticles nano shells nano cubes nano tubes those can be prepared deposition parameters can be controlled like i said if you control the deposition parameters so you can control the size you can control the thickness of the film or you can control the length of the wire that you are creating then narrow size distribution is possible so if you want in particular a uh, size range the particles you can control that to some extent and it, these techniques are cheaper now there are disadvantages disadvantages are large scale production is very difficult and chemical purification of nanoparticles is re uh, required in these techniques okay so we will see uh, what is the growth kinetics in bottom up synthesis so we will see here as we can see synthesis of nanoparticle is basically combination of two stage processes first nucleation takes place and then growth processes take place so new what is nucleation as you can see this figure here nucleation nucleation is the process whereby nuclei acts as a template for crystal growth so very small atomic level particles or ions are created initially here which is nucleation and then they agglomerate or aggregate until the desired size of nanoparticle is created okay so now these nucleation and growth can be two types heterogeneous heterogeneous heter sorry heterogeneous and homogeneous so in case of heterogeneous what happens you take two different types of materials and you combine them so final product product is combination uh, a core shell combination or a composite company composition where you have material a and material b both together in the nanoparticle form so both the qualities can be combined both the materials are combined so the properties of the material a and material b can be combined in such examples or such synthesis 
So we will see um, gas phase fabrications first in bottom-up approaches, okay? And we will see one by one. So we'll see first what is PVD, how uh, physical vapor deposition works. So fundamentally, all uh, physical vapor deposition techniques or vapor deposition techniques are same. So initially you have a precursor as you can see in this diagram. Then the precursor is converted into gaseous form, then intermediate gaseous form, then you get the primary particle where nucleation or condensation starts and then grains grow either in nanoparticles or in nanocluster. If they agglomerated, they become nanocluster. And if they are grown using the temperature or sintering, then nanoparticles can be achieved. Okay, so let's see one by one physical vapor deposition. So let's first focus on inner, inert gas condensation. So what happens in inert gas condensation? So two keywords are here, inert gas and condensation, right? So there is a chamber which is called condensation chamber and there is another chamber which is called deposition chamber. So in condensation chamber, you have the metal target or the material target of which material you want to create nanoparticles or you want to deposit those nanoparticles on a substrate here, okay? So what happens here, they are formed by the evaporation of metallic source in inert atmosphere. So why inert gas is needed there? See, you can uh, create the vapor of this uh, material and then you can deposit it. So why we need inert gas? So the inert gas is needed because when the collision of these vapors happens with the inert gas, the inert gas helps in reducing the kinetic energy of the particles. So they slow down and they are ready to be deposited. And this substrate is cooled here. And then on this substrate, those particles get deposited. As you can see in this figure B here, the, this is the source. So here they have taken I and S B atoms, okay? And then these atoms are atomized or in the vapor form. And then organ gas is colliding with these atoms and then the kinetic energy is being reduced. Since the kinetic energy is low, they are getting agglomerated. And finally, they are being deposited on substrate. Now you can control the rate of sputtering, rate of um, the vaporization, and that way you can control the thickness of the material on your substrate where you are depositing it. Okay, so this is one way. Now we let's see evaporation. How we do the gas phase fabrication using physical vapor deposition in terms of ev evaporation. So there are two ways that you can evaporate, thermal evaporation and electron beam ev evaporation. So as the name suggests, thermal ev evaporation, you are using a heater, heating coil with high current and the metal target. Usually the metal uh, nanoparticles are created in substrates are deposited. So here you are using heater and here you can mount a crystal monitor and you can control the thickness of the, subs, uh, the deposition. So if you can monitor how, how much thickness is there, then if you are happy with say 10 nanometer thickness or 20 nanometer thickness, then you can stop it there. Or if you want 200, 300, 400 nanometers, so you can go up to that level also. Similarly, electron beam evaporation, you use electron beam or electron gun here to evaporate the metal target and the substrate is cooled here. And on substrate, these vapors go and dep get deposited. So these are the other methods which, we, which are used. Then there is another method of physical vapor deposition, which is plasma arcing. 
So let's see what happens. As the name suggests, plasma of inert gas is taken and arc is created. And that arc is created, as you can see here, these blue things, this is a blue electrode and this is anode here. And between this, the arc jet is here, which is creating the arc and the metal is getting vaporized here or the target which you want to make nanoparticles of. And then there is a substrate which is being cooled here, either using cooling water or using liquid nitrogen. And then this is being deposited on this substrate, okay? So material is vaporized between two electrodes by arc produced by applying a very, very high voltage, which is 15 to 100 voltage across these two volt, uh, electrodes. Now this ionizes the inert gas and plasma is generated and the temperature is really, really high. Now metal atoms are evaporated and they are condensed on the water-cooled substrate here. Okay. So usually... Hello. Yeah. Okay, so then the other technique that uh, falls under this category, physical vapor deposition is laser ablation. So in laser ablation, the most uh, known example is pulse laser deposition system. So uh, there the, the target is uh, illuminated by the laser light or laser intensity. And the laser light, the, the power of laser helps in vaporizing the target. And then again, it is deposited on a uh, substrate. And here the advantage is you can have multiple targets. So suppose you want to uh, make a layer of material A, B, and C. So you can have three, three targets here and you can illuminate with laser target A first. Okay, you can rotate the target uh, channel here. You can rotate this thing here where the targets are fixed and target, first you illuminate the target A, get it deposited. Then you again focus the laser beam on target B, get another layer of that, then get target C, another layer of that, and then you can also decide the thickness of the individual layers. So if layer A you need thicker and layer B you need thinner, that also you can control. So this is most popular and uh, most productive method for uh, thin film production, and it is very effective in terms of controlling the thickness and all, all other parameters. Then the other thing is uh, sputtering in physical vapor deposition techniques. So physical vapor deposition using sputtering is, as the name suggests, sputter depositions are methods of depositing thin films by sputtering and they involve ejecting material from a target that is a source onto a substrate such as silicon vapor. So nothing much different than what we are doing in other techniques, but atoms of target materials are ejected or spurred by high energy ion bombardment of high energy noble gas atom. Okay, mostly argon is used in this technique and it is produced, the, the sputtering, uh, the uh, material is sputtered using a high voltage DC or RF, radio frequency glow discharge. Okay, and ejected sputtered atoms form a thin film coating on the substrate and substrate is actually nothing but anode. So anode is connected with the substrate. So whatever is sputtered is uh, attracted by anode and the deposition takes place and you get a nice thin film here of the nanomaterials. Then there is another method which is CVD, chemical vapor deposition. So it is again the same thing, but it is often used in semiconductor industries to produce thin films, okay? In a typical CVD process, the wafer is exposed to one or more volatile precursors like PLD we just discussed. It reacts 
or decomposes on the substrate surface to produce the desired deposit. So there is some involvement of chemical process. So it decomposes also. So you, you uh, control the vapors in such a way that at a particular temperature, at a particular point, they decompose and they give you the desired nanoparticles. Then we will uh, learn a little bit about liquid phase fabrication. So in liquid phase fabrication, generally precursor is taken, then it is generally dissolved in some solvent where it is dissolved nicely. Then intermediate is created. Again, either nucleation or condensation takes place or liquid solid surface reaction happens and the gel is formed, okay? And then that gel or that solution is used as primary particles. So either you dry that gel and you heat it up to different temperatures and you get different sizes of nanoparticles or you can, you can either spin coat it or you can use it in dip coating and you can have nanoclusters or thin film of nanoparticles or that material can um, undergo, undergo through agglomeration. If you add some reactant to that and you agglomerate those particles and you get the clusters of nanoparticles also. So we will see them in some detail now. So starting material liquid phase, one very good example of colloidal method is formation of gold nanoparticles. So where HAUCl4 is taken here, the solution, the solution is heated and sodium citrate is added to this solution and it is further heated and finally you get red color. So the colloidal process takes place inside the solution, okay? And finally, the color turns into either red or purple, depending upon what kind of gold nanoparticle you are getting. The other method is wet chemical method, where you take solution of material A, solution of material B, or B and C. They mix and then mix them sufficiently and provide them appropriate temperature and time. Then add precipitation, precipitation agents, then precipitation takes place, aging and washing, then you wait for them, the precipitation should complete, then you wash that material and you take the precipitated particles and then in the, in the solution there are nanoparticles which you can dry, anneal and calcine and you get the nanomaterial. So in wet chemical methods are many, and then we will see them one by one. So one is sol gel method, okay? This is very important method and it is used for R&D of nanoparticles very broadly and largely. So you take a precursor, you dissolve precursor in a solution uh, where all the precursors are dissolved very nicely. If needed, you heat, or sometimes heat is not needed and gel is formed, but most of the times in different, different particles, the requirement is different. So the solution is heated and the gel is formed. Now this solution, this sol solution can be used directly for spin coating and the coated material will have the nanoparticle of the desired materials, or you can have a substrate dip in the solution and dry it uniformly using heat. It, so it will center the material, it will center the solution and you will get the nanoparticles or you can dry it as a powder and calcine it so that you can get the desired nanomaterial as well, okay? So this is a typical bismuth ferrite synthesis um, protocol where you can, you take the precursors here and then you heat the solution, solution reduced, intermediate nitrate fumes are coming out. And then there you heat it so much that only a gel 
is remaining. There is no liquid remaining in the solution. You heat it until then and then let it dry and then heat it. And then finally, you get a powder out of gel. When you grind that gel, you get the powder and that powder can be annealed at different temperatures. So if you anneal the, say for example, you anneal at 400 degrees Celsius, you might get this particle size, say 60 nanometer. Now you anneal the same powder at 500 degrees Celsius, the particle size will increase a little bit. And then as you increase the temperature, the particle size increases. So you have to optimize the sintering temperature in between so that you can get the desired particle size. Then the other method is microemulsion method. It is very interesting. What is microemulsion? So microemulsion is nothing but isotropic and thermodynamically stable dispersion of oil, water, surfactant, or maybe co-surfactant. So basically microemulsion is characterized with oil in water or water in oil. So these are the two examples and that's how you denote them in figure form. So hydrophobic and hydrophilic groups are denoted like this. So you see this, the dot, the dot indicates the hydrophilic group and this tail indicates the hydrophobic group. So if the aqueous medium is inside and the oily medium is outside, so that is, that is how it looks like and uh, that's how you uh, demonstrate in, in the figure form and this is called reverse missile structure. And the, if you take the other way around where the uh, hydrophilic group is outside and hydrophobic group is inside, that is called the missile structure. Okay, so and then there is a biocontinuous, bicontinuous missile as well, where it is in continuation and there is no uh, surrounding, like it is not uh, confining the material in a circle, but it is in a continuous way in a solution. So there are three kinds of missiles which are possible and then micro emulsion method takes place. So how the mechanism of microemulsion method takes place is this. So there can be one microemulsion, you can use one microemulsion or you can use two microemulsion. So if you want to combine two microemulsions, you can take two different kind of microemulsion and then you react them together. And when you combine, since the boundaries are same, they combine together and in appropriate temperature and appropriate create conditions, you get the desired nanoparticles, which is result of these two reactions here. And when you take only one phase or one microemulsion, then you get a single kind of nanoparticle using appropriate kind of reactant and reaction triggering agent. Then the last one of this series is spray pyrolysis. And in this method, uh, we just uh, use the spray. And uh, since we use very powerful spray here, the, the spray nozzle has very small uh, opening and a very powerful uh, energy you are providing to the substrate, uh, to the, the material that is uh, the precursor material. So what happens, uh, you get uh, atomized spray and that spray gets deposited on the substrate and then it create, it gets agglomerated there and or nucleation takes place in between, between this nozzle and the substrate and final product is the nanoparticles that is desired. So I have very uh, briefly discussed all the methods because of the limitation of the time that we have here. But uh, each and every method can have the whole uh, one hour lecture or more to understand it really well. So uh, if you really want to learn about this, you need to study them one by one in detail with examples and you need to. So maybe take away from here should be that each method you should understand 
understand, learn, and then find out which nanoparticles are mostly synthesized using which method. If this interests you, you should do this. After this, I will uh, quickly uh, cover the characterization of nanoparticles. So now, very difficult task, structural characterization of nanoparticles. Because we can say, okay, we are going to do the structural characterization, but what to measure? What will you measure to do the structural characterization? So it's a key question and it is very difficult to decide. And there is no straightforward answer because every uh, kind of nanoparticle has different application and that with different characterization is needed. So broadly, we can say that size, shape, surface charge, and porosity, these things are need to be measured to characterize a nanomaterial in terms of its structure properly, okay? So structural characterization refers to investigation regarding structure, morphology, particle size, particle size distribution, etc. So let's see. So what, what do we mean by size of nanoparticle? Okay, so one to 100 nanometer. So one nanometer to 100 nanometer, as you can see here, is the size of the nanomaterial. And we want to measure that size. So it, is, it already is very difficult because 10 nanometer, you understand how small it is. So basically, when you have to measure the size, so size can be re referred as its overall physical dimension defined by the atomic structure or an effective size we want to measure because many times nanoparticles are agglomerated in the solution. So we want to measure that size which comes after the agglomeration and then they are stable after the agglomeration. So that size is also the size of the nanoparticle because that's what is the effective size at that time. So how we measure the size of the nanoparticle. So spherical nanoparticles, it is very easy because they are spherical, they are uniform symmetrical. So you can just measure the diameter or uh, you are, and you are done. But if there are different, if there is a rod or if there is a ribbon or even nanofiber or there is a wire, then you have to measure three uh, dimensions. So like you see this figure D1, so you need to know the length, you need to know, know the width, and you need to know the height of that material. So it is not an easy task measuring all that at such small scale. So basically what, and then there is another measurement which is often in practice, it is called effective radius, okay? So you have to sometimes calculate the effective radius of the nanomaterials. So what is effective radius? So if the, this, suppose this purple, if you can focus here on this purple uh, nanomaterial. So it is a shape of a oval, okay? Now, if it is rotating in certain axis, then if it is rotating like this, then probably you will want to measure this because it is rotating in particular speed and generally effectively it will be like this because it is rotating and it is not stable, right? So then this black dotted line will be actually its effective radius. Sometimes you want to measure it in terms of absorbed ions. Some material has absorbed some positive ions or negative ions. And then after that, what is its size? So that is effective radius for that material. So sometimes we need to measure that to be sure that this is the size of the material because that nanomaterial is going to stay in that state in the material or in the application. So that is the size that should be considered, which is effective radius. Okay. Now, particle size distribution distribution is also very important. So sometimes you get a particle size distribution in the material. So you were trying to synthesize say 50 nanometer particles, but find 30 nanometer, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100 nanometers also. So you need to find out 
if if the 15 nanometer particles are 80 percent and rest the, of the sizes are very less then you are to an extent or you are quite successful in what you were trying to achieve because 100 percent particle size distribution is usually not possible with the techniques that we do in the laboratories because we don't have very very sophisticated lab laboratories right and again the conditions are not very easy to control so particle size distribution is also very important to measure and we need to measure that as well but now how will we measure the shape of, of the nanoparticle and why it is important so shape also decides what kind of properties we can achieve for example gold nanoparticles gold nanostars gold nanowires they all have different optical properties so shape actually matters so if this is the actual this maroon object here is the actual shape of the material then tem projections can be either this because if the tem focusing beam is looking at the particle from the top then it will see the particle like this and if it is seeing from the sides it, the particle will look like this okay and then you have to average it out or you have to uh, conclude based on the images that you get through TEM that both the dimensions are available and this is the actual shape of the particle. Then there are other methods which are based on scattering. So the light is scattered and the form, uh, a, a form is created and that uh, shape also tells you what kind of shape nanoparticle will have. But see, if the scattering, if you use, then this is seen as oval while this is a rod. So more accurate is TEM projections, transmission electron microscopy. So the shape is important. Then porosity of nanoparticle is also important because characterization of porous nanoparticles is important in certain applications. So what you need to know about porosity, the size of the pore opening, how much big the pore is, the dimension and volume of the porous cavity. So what are the dimension and what is the volume of this cavity? And then interconnection of porous structure. That means how far are these porous, connect, um, porous structures are situated? What is the symmetry between them? What is, how, how, is, how is the arrangement of that porosity? All those things are important. And then specific surface area also is, needs to be measured. And then surface to volume ratio is important to find out in terms of porosity. The inner and outer surface functional, functionalization is also important. That means this blue thing, if you can see that is inner surface and this is outer surface. So what kind of molecules are associated with inner surface? and why this is these pores are formed so because definitely there are different uh, molecular structure that's why the morphology is changing here so we need to know what are the surface functionalization inside and outside okay so then there are these these are the techniques which can be used to find out the size shape particle size distribution and as well as porosity. So these are the techniques, TEM, SEM, FM. Maybe you know, or maybe some of you may not be knowing, so I will just say tunneling on my X-ray diffraction technique and gas, gas absorption. So gas absorption is mostly for uh, um, surface area, pore volume, pore size distribution, and other things. Now, these are different parameters. I think uh, we are running out of time. So I will not uh, just read it, but you can have a look of what are the parameters that we can measure with different techniques and what are the advantages. After this, there are, um, so we just uh, very briefly looked at what are the structural parameters that we can measure 
but nanoparticle characterization is not about only structural characterization but we need to measure the physical properties also like what is its optical properties what are the magnetic properties what are the electrical properties thermodynamic properties then other thing so those techniques uh, there are number of techniques and immense technologies associated with nanotechnology where you can measure so many things and it's a very very vast subject to discuss okay. so these are some examples of structural characterization which is our work and these are some uh, physical property measurements from our work so i think uh, i will just thank all of you for listening and paying attention and before i end my talk i want to acknowledge and thank my mentors colleagues and students who have contributed uh, for my journey this far and whatever work i have done so far in this area thank you very much if you have any questions now i am open for that session is open for question and answers and question is still to to me chat box me down sakta uh, we will wait for more two more minutes and then questions will wait if you have any questions please put it in chat box anything you want to uh, and one question is there uh, why size of particle increase with increase in temperature is it in the chat box yes ma'am uh, it is in a chat box why size of uh, professor nilesh masrar from uh, why size of particle increase is with increase in temperature hello yeah the particle and you are not audible yes yes uh, the question is why particle size increases with temperature so uh, what happens the the particle size uh, when you increase the temperature the small particles come together and then they the particle size uh, grows because it gets the energy to agglomerate and then they get together they they react they get together and the particle size grows okay ma'am you are satisfied with your answer thank you from uh, professor nilesh masrai so um, from entire uh, team of this project from sivir pune i would like to thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to be a guest speaker at uh, our webinar uh, thank you so much ma'am and the session is i would declare the session is over now thank you so much ma'am thank you thank you so much i hope um, people could understand students could understand and if you have any other questions any query please feel free to contact me and uh, my email id is with i think priyanka uh, so is also there. yeah uh, <laughs> thank you dr smita for your uh, nice lectures to our students to the community hello yes sir i can hear you thank you so yes, much yes, for yes, the yes. opportunity and i hope i could do the justice with the content and students yes yes i think they will get more benefited i think they 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 may get aware about the techniques and all that because the participants are from the graduate as well as post graduate level and the graduate is uh, from first year to three, uh, third year bsc 
and they are from electronics physics as well as chemistry similar with the postgraduate so i hope they will get benefited and uh, actually we are getting the feedbacks from the students they are getting benefited through these lectures okay uh, you that, that, i think i think you have visited uh, cement for some analysis while you were in icer maybe because i have been uh, working with professor kulkarni uh, when she was in icer and yeah. uh, later i was working with professor ogle until yeah, i joined yeah, yeah, yeah. because for t for i remember analysis. yes for tr right. analysis i think i think you visited right me. and they were magnetic uh, nanoparticles bismuth ferrite so there was a reluctance about yes, that yes, right yes, yes. because because uh, see when priyanka told me i i said i could remember her the name because you visited for the analysis yes uh, sure uh i look forward to meet you all again when yeah, the yeah. pandemic is ending definitely and probably some work can be carried out further yes 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 sure sure yes sir professor gosa is a friend of mine yeah yeah he knows me very <laughs> well also and i keep meeting him in the university yeah, yeah. and he is like a mentor and guide to know, me whenever I, I, I have to take advice i go to him right yeah he is very nice and kind yeah. both professor gosavi and professor kumbar i have a so professor <laughs> kumbar is my head of the department yes yes, yes. i know i know i know yes yeah. so thank they, you they they both are very very helpful and very good mentors so i am lucky to have people like those around thank yeah you. so thank you once again for you are uh... thank you sir thank you for having me yeah. yeah thank, thank you. you sir thank you ma'am thank you so much thank you and bye bye everyone uh, thank you ma'am